This year, the symposium committee is pleased to co-sponsor the memorial lecture with the Ross School of Business. I want to express our appreciation to Dean Robert Dolan, the faculty, staff, and students at the Ross School for their cooperation. I'd also like to acknowledge two of our university regents who are with us today. Regent Julia Darlow. Is she? She's here somewhere. And Regent Catherine White. Right here. At the heart of Dr. King's philosophy was the idea of service, service and tr charity to others. Service and charity, he believed, are among the soul's highest purposes. As we're all aware, one of the poorest and least developed nations in the world is suffering from a massive and devastating earthquake. While relief organizations from all over the world are working to assist Haiti, more needs to be done. Hundreds of thousands of people are in need of the very basics for survival, food, water, shelter, and medical attention. Numerous organizations here in our community, nationally and internationally, are at this moment working to relieve the people of Haiti to save lives and to save a nation. Please offer your service and do what you can do to help. To assist in that, please go to the University of Michigan's website to learn how you might be of assistance. About service, Dr. King said, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. And you don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. So please let us have a moment of silence for the people of Haiti. Again, let us celebrate this year's commemoration for Dr. King's work as a day with emphasis, with special emphasis on service and charity to the people of Haiti. I want to offer a special thanks to those individuals and groups on the campus who worked tirelessly to make this year's commemoration a success. First to President Teresa, I mean, <laughs> Provost Teresa Sullivan. Where is she? Provost, there's Provost Sullivan. I must say that that was an intentional slip because President Sullivan, as many of you know, will become the president of the University of Virginia, and we are losing a great leader here at the University of Michigan. But I do want to thank um, Provost Sullivan and Dean Robert Dolan for hosting this, year, this morning's breakfast for uh, Glenn Eiffel. Uh, we were joined by many people from the community and here on campus, and it was a wonderful gathering for all of us. Organizing and mounting the symposium is a year-round operation carried out by the Martin Luther King Day Planning Committee and the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives. And for that reason, I want to thank Associate Vice Provost and Director of OEMI, Dr. John Matlock, the symposium coordinator, Ms. Theta Gibbs, members of the symposium planning committee, and the OEMI staff. Thanks also to Ms. Gwen Tandy from Conference Services and to Julie Vance and Angelique Taylor, our American Sign Language interpreters. And to all of our campus and community groups who work to organize the many events that are spread over the next four weeks. We are grateful for your efforts and thanks to you all. I would now like to introduce the 13th president of the University of Michigan, Dr. Mary Sue Coleman. Good morning. As always, we owe a great deal to Dr. Monts and his staff, as well as to Dr. John Matlock, the Office of Academic Multicultural Initiatives, 
and the Martin Luther King Committee for bringing us this important symposium. Please join me again in thanking them for their leadership in building such a thoughtful series of events, including bringing the nationally renowned journalist Gwen Eiffel to our campus. Be a catalyst for change. These are the words of Shirley Chisholm that have shaped this year's symposium. Be a catalyst for change. I've been thinking about her mandate quite a bit in recent days, particularly as our campus pauses to reflect not only on the Haiti disaster, but also the life of former university president Robin Fleming, who passed away a week ago today. Robin Fleming possessed an extraordinary personality, one particularly suited for an era when conflict, tension, and unrest were the norms on college campuses. He was calm in the face of chaos, and he listened to many, many passionate voices. Most important, he moved the university forward in ways that continue to benefit students, faculty, and staff. This year, 2010 marks the 40th anniversary of the Center for Afro-American and African Studies. CAS has devoted the last four decades to exploring Africa and the African diaspora in the context of our world through interdisciplinary courses, community outreach, and academic exchange programs. CAS came about because U of M students and faculty, their work, and because of President Fleming. In 1970, students and faculty rightfully protested the poor representation of African Americans on this campus. In fact, they stood on the steps of this building and threatened to shut down the university unless changes were made. President Fleming listened and responded. Among his many reactions to this campus crisis was to move forward and make real the Center for Afro-American and African Studies. With 40 years to its name, CAS has educated thousands of students and prepared countless scholars to carry forward the knowledge that they gained here. To see that outgrowth, one can look some 40 miles from here in downtown Detroit. One of the offerings of CAS has been an undergraduate course in urban and community studies cross-listed with the residential college. Three years ago, based on their positive experiences in that course, several students came forward with an exciting proposal. The university, they said, should offer an intense academic program that places students in Detroit, not for a day, not for a weekend, but for an entire semester. Just as U of M students study abroad to gain knowledge, they should also travel to Detroit to live in and learn about Michigan's largest city and what it means to the future of urban life. Now in its second year, the Semester in Detroit program involves nearly two dozen Michigan students. They're engaged in a unique curriculum and equally important, engaged in community organizations throughout Detroit. They're learning about urban planning, history, sustainability, race, and geography. They're taking these classroom lessons and applying them in schools, neighborhood centers, businesses, and soup kitchens. And they are staying in Detroit long after the semester ends. They're learning about themselves and their capacity to make a difference and be a catalyst. They are changing the community as much as the community is changing them. As one student said, this kind of experiential learning helps you see your place in the world. Change happens when people listen to others and act upon their concerns as President Fleming did in helping establish CAS. Change unfolds through teaching and scholarship as demonstrated by CAS faculty and professors throughout our university who are committed to broadening our understanding of the world with their knowledge and insight. And change occurs when people come forward to make a difference through action and thought as we are seen with students who study and live in Detroit students inspired by today's faculty and by a program with roots in a soft-spoken academic leader from a past generation. This is what it means to be a catalyst, to initiate change, to make a difference 
with your ideas and actions. The ramifications can be boundless and the benefits lasting. Reverend King said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? As individuals, as a university, we must always find answers to that question. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Dean of the Stephen M. Ross School of Business, Robert Dolan, as the Edward J. Fryer Dean of Business and the Stephen M. Ross Professor of Business. He, and his, he is in his ninth year of leading our, one of our country's leading business schools and one deeply committed to leadership development. Please welcome Dean Robert Dolan. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to add my welcome to this morning's uh, keynote address. Our program here will have uh, three parts. First, uh, Gwen will offer some remarks, and then there'll be a Q&A session, uh, during which time there'll be uh, people in the two aisles down here on the main floor. So if you're up there, you'll have to come on down, and uh, they will uh, queue up and, and ask Gwen any, any questions. And then finally, there'll, there'll be a book signing. You know, to me, it's always a great treat to uh, have a chance to interact with someone who has risen to the absolute uh, top of their uh, profession. And I think uh, when I think about today's speaker, it's uh, striking she has not risen to the top in one, but in fact three different, albeit related professions, but, but different, I think. You know, Gwen Eiffel started in the newspaper business, starting in the, with the Boston and Herald American and then moving on to the Baltimore Evening Sun and then to the Washington Post and finally to the New York Times where she was the uh, White House correspondent. Then on to the broadcast world with Washington Week and PBS NewsHour and finally as a best-selling author with her book Breakthrough Politics and Race in the Age of Obama. And it's really quite extraordinary, I think, for somebody to be able to communicate via all of those different uh, media. So it's a great pleasure to have her here today. You know, all along uh, Ms. Eiffel's career, there have been the kind of uh, honors and awards you might expect, even including cool things like an honorary doctorate that we in the academic world, of course, uh, prize tremendously. But what was more striking to me than any of that was what Publishers Weekly wrote about her when they were reviewing her book. And Publishers Weekly said, Gwen Eiffel is professional, authoritative, but never stuffy. And I thought, well, gee, that's sort of an ideal person to have a conversation with on Martin Luther King Day about how we can most well honor his legacy. So it's a real pleasure for us to welcome Gwen Eiffel to the University of Michigan. Thank you. You know, you can save the standing O for the end, really. <laughs> I'll be ready for it. I am thrilled to be here with you today. It is an honor, it is a pleasure, and you've managed to make it above 12 degrees, which I deeply appreciate. <laughs> But it's, it's especially an honor uh, to follow in the footsteps of the people who have delivered this lecture. I mean, everyone from Cesar Chavez to Shirley Chisholm to Nikki Giovanni and Ben Carson. I don't know how I fit in that group, but I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you very much. And you can, might also imagine that this is actually kind of a good day. Actually, every day is a good day to be out of Washington, D.C. <laughs> so much goes on that really doesn't need to. And so much doesn't go on that does need to. <laughs> but so it's a good day to be out and about talking about the legacy of a man who embodied peace and hope and not war and disaster. And it's a good day to be reminded that this holiday means so much because of the man we honor, but also because of the effort it took to achieve holiday status. 
If we learned anything during these last awful days as we have struggled to cope with the enormity of the devastation in Haiti, it has been that great effort will be required to understand, to cope, and to move on from what we have witnessed and what others have so tragically experienced. There's often, however, something so perfunctory about days like these. We get a day off, the schools and the banks are closed, sometimes there are sales. <laughs> but perhaps because, for so many of us, Martin Luther King Jr. represents contemporary history, the immediacy of the celebration is so much more fresh. And we must at all costs keep that hope alive. Events of the past few years have given us many reasons to reconsider how we celebrate Dr. King's achievements. We have a black president, we have black governors, we have members of Congress and CEOs, and some of them even lack Negro dialects. <laughs> Much like myself. That's an entirely different speech, sorry. <laughs> Certainly if Dr. King were alive, he would be celebrating all of these achievements, satisfied that everything he wanted had come to pass, or a lot anyway. Perhaps he would be celebrating our new post-racial world. Okay, maybe not. And yet, yet, surely he would know that to get to the post-racial ideal he often spoke about, there were things left that we had to get through. But perhaps he would be leading another march on Washington, this time for health care, or he would be participating <laughs> or he would be participating in a sit-in outside the Sudanese embassy to force action on Darfur. Perhaps Perhaps he would realize that his role was always to be the agitator, not to be the one content with the way the world is. But I think it's very likely that he would be at an event like this, not to rest on the laurels or celebrate the laurels of achievement, but to press for more. More caring for the least of us, the homeless, at-risk youth, the underemployed, the unemployed. We've all attended our share of King holiday breakfasts and Black History Month lectures that talked on these themes. We have all sung, we shall overcome, and crossed our arms and held hands. We've all, most of us, have sung the Negro National Anthem, beautiful words, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, that who has brought us so far on the way. I would sing for you, but you don't want that. Thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us forever in the path we pray. Wonderful, uplifting words. Singing them gives us the opportunity to remember and to revel in the things we don't spend enough time thinking about the rest of the year. What a tragedy it would be if, in forgetting, we were forced to explain to future generations that Martin Luther King Jr. was more than a stamp, that he is more than a distant icon, Dr. King was so much more than that. He is so much more than that. And forgive me if I still speak of him in, in the present tense, because more than 40 years after he is killed, it's, he's still very present for me. He symbolizes, you see, in many ways, the ideas I strive to combine in my life. My life as a professional journalist, and my life as an African-American attempting to prosper in a society that often seems so hostile still. My father, was a preacher. And like every preacher I ever met who was alive in the 1960s, he said he marched with Martin Luther King. Um, <laughs> there are pictures, so I think it's true. <laughs> he also taught us that we had responsibilities. Responsibilities to our country, to our people, and to our God. He taught us that if anyone ever hurled the word black at us, intending it to be received as a slur, as it was in the 1960s, we should always respond, thank you. This was before James Brown, I'm black and I'm proud, and it was considered, in fact, Negro was really what was acceptable at the time. But we were shocked about the lesson our father was teaching us, which was that 
an effective rebuttal, a simple thank you, would just diffuse the intended insult. That many of the insult givers, many of them black by the way, would be reduced to silence. As preacher's kids, we had other challenges to meet as well. The expectations in our house were always high. We were lucky in that way, but I didn't realize how lucky until years later when I saw the havoc that can be reached, that can be wreaked in black families with low expectations. It is this striving for possibility that fueled the ambitions of a Harriet Tubman, who saw the possibilities in escaping slavery. And Sojourner Truth, who saw the possibilities of what women could add to the national conversation. To Martin Luther King Jr., who saw the possibilities of how equal access and simple justice could transform a nation. The possibilities for my parents, who saw how they could apply the lessons learned from those who preceded them to make a better life for their children, which is, after all, what we all are aspiring to. And because of those who have gone before, I remain committed to the things these people, and more like them, taught me were important. It's why I'm a journalist, actually, and it is how I came to believe that the search for the truth and the search for justice are not incompatible. In fact, they are essential. If we are to stay true to the hard-earned legacy left to us in the life of Dr. King, I believe that being born an American of African heritage has always been a challenge for us. It's easy to focus on the negatives of that. But those negatives and the positives we don't always focus on demand that we rise to the goals Dr. King set for us. It's why when I was a college student working at my first big summer job at a newspaper in Boston, I was able to shrug off the insult of finding a note one day intended for me that read, nigger, go home. It was why I was able to challenge the editors at the newspaper I worked with in Baltimore, at in Baltimore when they thoughtlessly decided to use a feature picture on page one of young black kids in the back of a truck eating watermelon, how lovely. It's why I was able to moderate political debates and interview world leaders and know that the people I was to question owed me, this little colored girl, an answer. As I've traveled the nation last year and, and talking about my book and, and the political breakthroughs I've seen and I've covered, I've been struck at how hard a time we are still having talking about race. We take pains to identify people by anything, hair color, eye color, jacket, anything except the most obvious identifier. My favorite moments come when you're in a room where there is only one black person and the person says, it's the guy with the blue blazer and the glasses. <laughs> and you say, the black guy? And they go, oh, is he black? I didn't notice. <laughs> Stating the obvious is perfectly fine unless the obvious happens to be about race. Look what happened to poor Harry Reid last week. He stated the obvious and it blew up in his face. I've had people go out of my way to tell me that they are colorblind. Now, I ask you, doesn't that just make them blind? <laughs> it's why I've had a gentleman tell me that only all black people were as well-spoken as President Obama is, or that I am, that all of our problems would be over. <laughs> Funny, he didn't have an answer when I asked him whether his people were all well-spoken. <laughs> or articulate, my other favorite word. But here's the deal, though. I, I don't get up every day feeling burdened by my race. Indeed, I feel empowered by it. To me, race is not about grievance. It's also about opportunity, and pride, and empathy, and humanity. Understanding the difference is it's understanding the value of difference. It's why even though I can maintain the journalist's arm length distance, I can also suffer sorrow and, and rage over tens of thousands of lives lost in Haiti, or drownings in New Orleans, or ethnic slaughter in Kosovo the death of one man behind a truck, the deaths of thousands on a beautiful Tuesday morning in September, 
who are thousands of thousands starving and dying in Darfur. If I stopped seeing the humanity in the news and started seeing only the news, then I would be a failure as a journalist and as a woman, and I would be a failure as a human being. I have that great, good, God-given fortune of being able to sit on the front row of history. It's not something I take lightly because I don't believe for even a moment that I got where I am in my career because of anything that I did by myself. My parents, as I mentioned, were West Indians, black people who chose to be African Americans. They taught me a lot of important things about what it means to be a black woman. They taught me that America is a land of opportunity, but that the opportunities are not going to fall in your jet lap just because you think they ought to. They convinced me that I could do anything I wanted, but I'd have to work for it. So I live inside my skin, and I live outside it as well. Like other black professionals, I keep a foot in at least two worlds, sometimes three, sometimes four. The key is to be who you are, wherever you are. My race is a source of pride. I, I don't, just don't want to be held back because of it, or in the words of the immortal James Brown, I don't need nobody to give me nothing, open up the door for me, I'll get it myself. <laughs> it's part of who I am, not all of who I am. I think that's what Dr. King meant when he said that he wished for his children not to be judged by the color of their skin. The operative word there was judged. He never said he wanted their race to be ignored. Many black folk I know believe with total certainty that we live in an irredeemably racist society, one constructed in such a way that folks who look like us can never catch a break. But how do we get there? How is it possible that we are in this position where people no longer believe that it is possible for us to be who we are? One of the things I think most interesting about that is that I also am dear friends with white people who believe that we are past it all. Oh, why do we have to talk about this? It just seems so, such a drag to talk about it. Can't we just pretend? I had a woman actually ask me once in public, you know, don't you think we can just not pretend, not mention that he's black? Speaking of the president. And I said, why would we want to do that unless we thought it was a bad thing? At which point they are very, uh, it pulls them up short, which is the best part for me. Before I went into television, I used to call people up to interview them on the phone and then have the satisfaction of watching the shock in their face when they met me for the first time. <laughs> you could tell that they were biting back the words, but you don't sound black. <laughs> I miss that. Television has really ruined all that for me. <laughs> but. What would it mean to be black, to be white, to be American, to be a citizen of the world if we didn't invest in the legacy that Dr. King left for us? It's all there in the words of his most famous speech. I think I Have a Dream is appealing to us because the idea of dreaming is so much easier than the reality of fighting to achieve that dream. But we have to dream and we have to fight too. My parents, like Dr. King and Coretta, dreamed their children would be able to accomplish anything they wanted. And although my father was an old-fashioned male chauvinist, he somehow neglected to tell my sister and me that there wasn't anything we could do. What a shock it came to him to discover we took him seriously. <laughs> but how happy Dr. King would be to know that these days, for so many of us, the tough part is about setting priorities and making choices, building our careers, living honorable lives, working to give our children all the choices they deserve. How sad he would be to know that for so many of us, those ch choices and those opportunities still seem so far out of reach. But it's that last choice that I mentioned, working hard for our children that keeps us up at night. We don't want to knock down the walls and break through the glass ceilings only to discover our sons and daughters don't want to walk through that there are new doorways, but they don't, they're not interested in soaring to the next level. And so many of our sons and daughters buy into limits imposed by race, no matter what race they happen to be. I've listened to my white friends talk cautiously about their race grievances, and I've listened to the black friends talk about theirs, and everyone has a point to make, and everyone has stories like my 
to tell. But if we don't get past our grievances, we will never meet our expectations, the expectations that Dr. King set for us. But how do we get there? How do we get past our preconceptions, our knee-jerk defensiveness, back to the place where we can recapture the expectation? Well, it seems appropriate for us this morning to turn to the words of Dr. King for inspiration. But I'm not going to read you the ha I Have a Dream speech or portions of it. You'll probably hear that plenty of other places today. I, I saw on the program there's even a place on campus where it's being read in Spanish, which is fabulous. <laughs> and you know, if you miss it this week, next month is Black History Month, there will be new opportunities. <laughs> Instead, I am going to read for, for, for you from a piece of Dr. King's body of work that it rocked me the first time I read it and has never failed to touch me every time since. It's from his letter from a Birmingham jail. Written in 1963 on scraps of paper he borrowed from his jailers while he was being held behind bars. Its brilliance lies in words that can be applied to almost every situation. He was writing about race, but listen to the words. He was speaking to anyone who has ever had an uphill bo battle to fight. These are his words. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our, dis at, with one of our distinguished jurors that justice too long delayed is justice denied, he wrote. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it was easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers and sisters smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in, and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly in tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued by inner fears and outer resentments. When you are ever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it so difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. Those were Dr. King's words. They remind us how far we've come and how far we haven't. It is easy to forget more than 40 years later how stark the choices were then. Most young people don't even know what a lunch counter is, let alone think about sitting in at one. We realize how limited their horizons were then. Now, of course, you'll say the times are different. We can go to the amusement park. There's so many things we no longer have to wait for. We have a black president. 
all's fixed, right? But if that's all you hear, you are missing Dr. King's point. He, in that speech, in that writing, it was making the case for expectation. We should expect to be treated as equal citizens. Our children should not expect to be inferior. We should all expect that anything is achievable, if not now, then soon. The barriers are still there. The corners are still dark sometimes. And I've rediscovered, rediscovered again and again that the world is often resistant to change. But shining a light, the light of justice, the light of understanding, the light of tolerance into the world is as necessary as it can be satisfying. And it is the real and it is the best way to honor the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. What time do you want me to put out the question? Thank you. Um, you know what? We can have time. Oh, oh, we'll cut it. I am. Thank you. I I have to admit that it, even though I love what you just did, that was a bit lovely. The favorite part comes for me now when I get to hear your questions. Um, that's where I get to learn what it is that's on your mind and think aloud for myself as we all struggle to come to grips with the issues. Uh, I will take any question you can think of. You can even ask me about Queen Latifah and I will answer. So uh, there are people in the, micro in the aisles with microphones with their hands in the air, the microphones in the air. And if you just approach them, um, we'll get started. Having moderated the uh, presidential debate, having reflected on all that occurred up to that point and after that point, what do you feel are the greatest challenges for our government? Wow. <laughs> he got right to it, didn't he? I have to say that as a professional observer, I don't think I have anything deeper to add than what is already on the president's plate. Whether you can, you can argue a little bit about whether it was a good idea for him to decide to take on health care, rescue a collapsed economy, let's see, um, try to get rid of nuclear weapons in Iran and North Korea, uh, oh, and deal with a couple of national disasters and a guy who set fire to his underwear, and all the things that come with being president. Um, oh, climate change and gay marriage, what, whatever, all these little things. Any one of them would have brought down a lesser man in his first year in office. Um, that said, that said, he hasn't mastered any of it yet. Um, it is hard, it is complicated, and change, it turns out, is a lovely, lovely slogan um, and a very, very difficult thing to pull off. So I, I'm not, I, I am fairly certain that coming into this, they didn't see all of this waiting for them. They couldn't have. But I also don't have a lot of pity or for, the, for the elected officials I cover because he spent a lot of money to get elected president. He made a real effort, and he made a lot of promises, some that he didn't have to make. So um, perhaps he will be able to do it, perhaps he won't. But it is clear, clearer than ever, that he has more problems ahead of them probably than behind him. Good morning, Ms. Eiffel. Thank you morning. for coming to um, my um, uh, alum, University of Michigan. My name is Audrey Jackson, and I have both undergraduate and graduate degrees from this university. I appreciate that you come from a background of journalism. And my question for you today has to do with um, resources. I want to say, first of all, um, you talked about expectation. I would argue that expectation is to success as resources are to access. You can expect yourself to be successful, um, but you also need 
in terms of resources, say the money or scholarships or whatever, okay. to be able to get Wait to a, a university. I know you've got a really good question there. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you to get to it because there are a lot of other people with questions too. The question is, how do you remove the color barrier to access? Whether you're talking about journalism or any other profession where uh, underrepresented people mm -hmm. of color want to go. Well, you're right. It's not enough to simply say, I want to do this, and obviously the doors don't swing open. Um, you know, the University of Michigan is a perfectly good place to have a conversation about the value and the debate about affirmative action, for instance. Uh, I always like to um, refer to what Colin Powell has had to say about this, which is, the reason why he is in favor of affirmative action is no one was against it when the other guys were getting the privileges. Um, and it, it's obviously more complicated than that, but what I was taught and what always became clear to me throughout my career and the people I see who succeed is that doors may be opened to you, but then you have to walk through and do something with it. And I know people who have gotten scholarships and then fail to score the necessary grades to keep their scholarships, well, they failed. The door was open to them and they dropped the ball. The key not only is to have the resources there, but then to do something with it. And, to ha and the expectation is not unimportant. I, you know, from, from little things, uh, the expectation that they're not gonna seat you by the kitchen, because if you ask, maybe they'll seat you by the front door. The expectation that your child will go to college or that they won't, that really is not quantifiable. The resources question is a huge one. I mean, I work in public broadcasting. There are so many things that happen and don't happen because of lack of or access to resources. My, I like to say that, that bad things get on the air because there's money and good things don't get on the air because there's not. But that doesn't mean you stop aspiring to it. It doesn't mean you don't stop reaching for it because you're cert if you decide you're certain they'll never give it to you, you're guaranteeing that they'll never give it to you. That That is almost in so many ways more valuable than the actual cash on the barrel head. Uh, you have to be able to push for it. And the, when I talk about the underemployed, I talk about people who are so discouraged they're not pushing for it anymore. And it's understandable. But it means that you have to pick yourself up after a short, short while to lick your wounds and keep going for it because nobody gives it to you. Hi, yes. good morning. My question is what can be done to raise awareness among people who are not in a place like Hill Auditorium, a town like Ann Arbor, people who are in places like the Deep South where even nowadays a cashier will look at a $20 bill given to her by an African American but not from a white person. Um, and what can be done for people who are simply out of the loop, so to speak, because it seems often awareness seems to be self-selecting and in certain circles, but it's not always reaching everybody else whom it should be reaching. And neither will it. I don't even have the expectation that I'm going to change every mind uh, simply by my example. Um, Lord knows I still can't get cabs if it's just the right time of dusk in Washington, D.C., um, even if I'm wearing a suit and carrying a, suit, a briefcase. Um, I understand that. Uh, the, the difference is, do you spend your time obsessing about the people who do or say the ignorant things, or do you spend your time building the possibilities of the people who want to effect positive change? Um, people often come to me and they'll say, can you believe so-and-so said that? You know, fill in the blank, Glenn Beck, Bill O'Reilly, Rush Limbaugh. And you know what, it's a free country. They're allowed to say whatever they want. In fact, I, you know, fabulous that they say it. But, I, but what I also want, don't want us to do is over-invest in the, the view of the people who would like to take us back. And that's one of what, the other things we have to do. Yeah, you're gonna get followed around a store more than the other people will. Yeah, there are gonna be things which still affect your sense of dignity. Um, but I learned a long time ago, for instance, that if that happens to me, that I, I used to, I, I used to, when I was young and foolish, feel that if someone would not wait on me in a store, and I knew I had money to spend doggone it, I would spend the money just to prove to them that I had it. Now I simply leave, uh, then I, uh, and keep my money in my pocket, but then I turn around and go back and tell them why I left. And I, that, maybe they take it in, maybe they don't, but I make sure that there is a lesson to be learned, and I do it in the most pleasant possible way, because 
frankly, conflict almost never gets heard. Um, and with race, we always go to conflict first. So it, it'd be nice to be able to change the world with a fell swoop, but it's so much better now than it was, and I'm, I'm happy to just keep pushing forward one step at a time. Michigan has many, many young people in prison, many young people dropping out of school. Way too many of them are minority and primarily children of color. You speak a lot about resilience and the individual pride that will carry many people forward, but don't we all have a responsibility to check and to change the systems that are holding so many people on, in oppression? Well, of course we do. Uh, there is no question that there is some, that the, the goal for Dr. King and people of the original civil rights movement that we think of as the iconic civil rights movement, their job in so many ways was to change laws, laws that denied access. But then once those laws are in the books, it doesn't, it, it, it's no longer quite the government responsibility that we've always expected it to be to make the next fix. It's the individual responsibility. And th if this day is about anything, it is about individual responsibility, not group responsibility, for whatever it is that troubles you. For some people, it's, your concern is about people who are incarcerated unfairly. For some people, they think it's just the hoodlums and I'm glad they're off the street. That's not what pushes them. But maybe there, sh but there should be something else that pushes them, something else that compels them. One of the things that I, I, I take heart in when I see the reaction um, the incredible generosity in the wake of the disaster in Haiti is that there is still a desire overwhelmingly am among Americans to do something, to take action, to fix things. We know when things are not right, but we, uh, and only when it's an international disaster do we all agree on what that is. But it means that the, but the, that the goal is still there, that the the desire is still there, that we are not quite as complacent and set in our ways as it sometimes seems. Hello, my Hi. question is this. I would like to know what your vision of world unity is and um, what can we do on a global level to reach that particular vision? I don't have a vision of world unity. Uh, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I am a journalist who looks at the small bore every day. Everybody I know who got into journalism thought we could change the world. Truly, this is, we know there are a lot of examples of journalists who are not, or people who call themselves journalists, who are not the ideal. But the people I know, the people in my circle thought, how can we use this as a lever to change what we see, to affect change? Now, does that mean that we come in it and say, I'm going to aspire to world unity? Hmm, no, not really. Does it mean that I want to make sure that people understand that politics affects whether their children get to go to school or not? That politics affects whether they get coverage in healthcare or not? that what happens behind closed doors is deserving and of an airing because your taxpayers are paying for, your tax money is paying for the doors? Yeah, that's my responsibility. Um, but I don't work or function in the world of the great vision of what the world ought to be because I think the world is a raucous place and there is no common understanding as we discovered in Iraq and in the Middle East of what even democracy is. The idea that we would go and create freedom. We don't even all agree about what the definitions are. So rather than imposing my vision, I want to hold people's feet to the fire for the promises that they've made. Good morning, Ms. Alpha. My name is Willie Cannon, and I'm a soon-to-be U of M grad. Uh, my question is, as a journalist, yay, as a journalist, uh, what, do you, what would you do if you were the head of the FCC regarding the uh, fairness doctrine and the multimedia uh, way they're trying to push agenda and disguising it as news? I would cover the story. <laughs> That's what journalists do. I, I would tell you about it, I would explain it, I would let you make your, up your own mind, not tell you what you ought to think or reach a conclusion. That's what journalists do. Despite what you may see sometimes masquerading as journalism, that's what we do. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Mr. Lawrence Mee. I'm a young man from Chicago. I go, I'm a freshman in uh, 
African American all boy charter school called Urban Prep. Mm -hmm. And my question is, do you have any words of wisdom for us as young men in the community trying to make it out? Because right right now in the community that we are in, it's many things that we see that I feel like we shouldn't be exposed to. For example, um, we actually not like directly across the street from our school. It's a building that really like sells drugs, and it try the people there right across the street literally try to get us as young men to come join them, and. You know, sometimes it's hard for us as young men to back away because of certain situations that we are in. So I'm asking, do you have any type of words of wisdom for us as young men? Resist the easy answers. One of the things that's appealing about folks talking to the young men on the street and saying, here, you can make a lot of money, you should always ask, why would that be so easy? It's not easy. It's hard. It's hard to get any level of accomplishment, and it's hard to even reach the goals sometimes you set for yourselves. But if anyone seems like they're giving you something for free, there's something you should, there are a couple extra questions you should be asking. Now, it's easy for me to say, you know, keep your nose clean and stay in school, but it's more than that, because you're doing that. It's more than that, it's also being rigorous in what you expect of yourself. And, the, and what you impose, what you expect of others in the way they speak to you, the way they treat you, and the way then you tell your story. You've got an important story to tell. You're very important. You're the future of whether we get out of this hole that we keep finding ourselves in or not. It means you have to find a way to express yourself the way you did today, getting up at a microphone and talking about it. It means you also have to find a, which is not a small thing. It also means, if, it also means, and I would implore you to write it down, to tell your story. It is so important, no matter what you do with your life, to find a way to tell the story by writing it down. Otherwise, it just goes away. One of the beautiful things about this program is we are, have people who are sharing from all walks of life in the weeks that we celebrate Dr. King's life, lots of ways to tell the story. Your story is as important as any story you see on TV or any story you see in a situation comedy or on a reality show. It's more important because our future depends on it. So own your importance, write it down, resist the easy answers. Thank you, Ms. Eiffel, and thank you to our audience members. This will be our last question for the oh, afternoon. Okay. I was getting good here. <laughs> good morning. Uh, having covered Washington for so many years, do you think the president's attempts at bipartisanship has been a perhaps a misguided strategy? Mm -hmm. And uh, part two, how do we... Since it's the last question, might as well slide another one. <laughs> right. Part two, given uh, the new technology in the media, how do we best give intelligent, thoughtful journalism a larger voice in the age of small minds and big voices, such as some of the ones that have been mentioned already? Well, I could just say write a check to PBS, but that would be cheap, wouldn't it? <laughs> Even though, um, uh, the first question about bipartisanship is an interesting one, because I'm very big on definitions and about the words we use and how we define them. And in fact, the truth is, Everyone has a different idea about what bipartisanship means. Truthfully, the definition in Washington has now become get one Republican vote. <laughs> Which is, I don't think, what we were talking about when we first talked about it. Now, there are a couple of different arguments about that. One is that, well, if you won and you control the House and the Senate, which after tomorrow's election in Massachusetts, maybe not so much, but that you then get to impose your worldview. And the other argument is that we are only healthier for talking across lines. And I think that it's the, it's the last argument, which is the most important one. We're not there right now. We are at the point where the high-minded talk about bipartisanship, which started uh, at the beginning of this administration, uh, fell apart the moment it turned out they couldn't get what they wanted that way. 
Um, and so right now we're in a very weird place in Washington in which heels have been dug in, in which people don't listen to each other. They're talking at each other. And I don't think it's healthy, no matter what side of the debate you're on. I don't think it's healthy when we stop talking to each other. Um, the second part, uh, I, you know, I take my share of hits for being in a media environment where we also talk past each other, uh, where people tell you what you ought to think, and they tell you, and they lecture to you what your conclusion is, and they devalue your opinion. Um, and I resist it at every turn, partly by choosing to be in public broadcasting, but also I remember a couple of weeks ago I was on a t Sunday morning program where everyone was um, making fun of Sarah Palin, and someone said, oh, she's just a joke, and this was the Republican. And I, and I said, uh, wait a second. Are you saying that everyone who thinks that Sarah Palin is the bee's knees is to be discounted? That's exactly the elitist thinking that, that makes people hate Washington. You're telling them that whatever you find appealing about her is completely ridiculous and misguided. Now, that's not listening, and that's a lack of diversity of thought, which has nothing to do with party identification. And the more we do that, the more we only listen to ourselves in our little bubbles, the more we decide what the scandal is. The scandal is that Harry Reid used the word Negro. No, it wasn't. The more that we decide that we don't want to hear the other side point of view because Lord knows, you know, they might, we may disagree, then we become a, a poorer society. I, I, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently by young people when I travel and talk in college campuses and in high schools is how do you um, keep your opinion out of your reporting? How can you not, how can you set aside what you believe? Don't you have any beliefs? Well, of course I have beliefs and of course I vote. But I d discovered a long time ago that if I decide in advance what I think about something, I'm gonna stop listening to you. I don't hear what you say after I've made up my mind. I, I, I enter every exchange, whether it's on television or in person, with the understanding and the possibility that you may have a point, that you may add something to my understanding, and that I need to know, for instance, if there are 10,000 people on the mall who identify themselves as the Tea Party movement, I may not understand it, but it's my job to understand it. And that's what I think more of us could do, certainly in my business, but also as individuals. The more we start talking away from each other instead of to each other and then stopping to listen, which by the way is the hardest part of every interview, listening to the answer, that's, yeah, hmm, yeah, you know the ones who don't, you know the ones who do. But it's really important that we find a way to do that. That is, that's the future, that's our health, that's, that's where we begin to learn. On that note, I guess I have to stop. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.